My name is Ross McGregor and I'm the Heritage Lead at the College. We're delighted to be joined on this event by our friend and collaborator, Dr Sharon Wigeekin from the University of Glasgow. Um, Sharon, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, so hello everyone. Um, thank you so, so much for coming out this evening and for the College for having me here. Um, it's always such a pleasure to work with the Heritage team here at the College. So yes, my name is Cheryl. I'm a lecturer in Human Geography at the University of Glasgow and my research focuses on issues of mental ill health, crime, violence and social and ecological justice. So thanks again for having me. Thanks Cheryl, um, and thanks for that introduction. It just kind of shows how unbelievably busy you are and how much you, you do. Um, so we really do appreciate you helping us with this event tonight. Um, so thank you. Um, so this is the fourth and final reframed event in our current programme. Um, we're doing these events to help us reveal our heritage in new ways to address issues of equality, diversity and inclusion. We're reframing our heritage by acknowledging that equalities are embedded in our history and in our collections. Heritage practice, uh, that is displays, engagement, activity, celebrations and so on, connects people to the past but often ignores inequalities that are part of the story. In this event tonight, we're going to focus on one particular collection which Cheryl and I have worked with extensively um, over the past few years um, and it's great tonight to be able to return to that collection that we, we've worked so much on. The College's archive of the papers of the surgeon Will, William McEwen um, contains a small number of, of items that record his work as a police surgeon early in his career in the 1870s. To give some context, the papers of William McEwen are extensive, covering his vast and impressive career in medicine and surgery, from his qualification in 1869 until his death in 1924. McEwen became an internationally lauded surgeon in the late 19th century, advancing practice in brain, bone and lung surgery, to name just a few of his achievements. His papers at the college reflect this amazing career. Um, these papers at the college um, are also complemented by significant collections held at the University of Glasgow's archives and at NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde archives. When McEwen qualified, or not long after he qualified, still aged only 23 in 1871 and until 1875, he worked as police surgeon at Glasgow Central Police Office on Albion Street in Merchant City. The archive material recording this period includes his private journal of surgical cases, uh, his medical scrapbook, as well as some other material that's listed there on the slide, including some correspondence with colleagues relating to his police surgeon cases. Some of the cases McEwen recorded in the private journal also formed the basis of articles in the Glasgow Medical Journal. And the role of the police surgeon was also referred to as the casualty surgeon. And from the records, it is clear that the police office functioned as a kind of accident and emergency department in the city centre, with McEwen treating patients there, in the streets and also in people's homes. So these records have been considered a fairly marginal part of McEwen's archive, given that they exist within this much bigger archive of, of lots of other things. Um, they record what has been considered a marginal early part of McEwen's career. This period in the early 1870s was when he was just beginning to establish his surgical career. Uh, and the marginality of these records is something that we will return to, uh, I'm sure, in our discussion later on. Before we begin to talk about the records of mental illness in the archive, um, it's probably worth us just mentioning how we got ourselves involved in these police surgeon records in the first place. Um, from my point of view, they were an, an immediately appealing part of the McEwen archive, uh, probably because they uncovered this little known aspect of the famous surgeon's incredible career 
they gave us an opportunity to tell McEwan's story in a different way, which is something that always appeals to me. So Cheryl, what about you? What was the appeal of this material when you first encountered it? Yeah, so throughout my research career, I've always been interested um, and also just personally really interested in the experiences and lived geographies of, of mental ill health. And increasingly throughout the process, I've really been drawn to think about how these experiences relate to wider structures, be that political, social, economic, etc. And these had really led me to think much more carefully about notions of violence, um, which I'll say a little bit more about later on in our conversation. So records relating to crime and violence really appealed to me to kind of encourage some of those interests. But alongside this, I'm a huge crime fiction fan. Um, I'm very much tied to this notion that particularly relates to the author Val McDermott's sort of commentary on this topic, that crime can offer us a window into the ruptures of our social world. So when I first encountered this archival material, I wasn't thinking about it in relation to mental ill health, um, but instead to what it might reveal about the connections between violence, medicine and social space. And I was really attracted to this material because it felt very raw and immediate. And as a geographer, it has this incredible ability to bring the city and its micro histories to life in, in an extremely vivid way. So I guess the appeal was immediate, it was quite unexpected and it was really multiple in its formations too. Thanks Cheryl, yeah that's definitely one thing about the records, these police surgeon records is that vivid picture of, of Glasgow at that time that, that they, they provide us with which is one of the things that I think people kind of get when, when we do start to, to share the records with them. Um, so now I'm, I'm just going to talk for a wee bit, um, before going back to Cheryl, I'm, I'm going to talk for a bit about encountering experiences of mental ill health in the police surgeon records from a heritage perspective and also from a personal perspective. I think my reading of the police surgeon cases began to shift um, after being absorbed in them for a while and through discussion with you, Cheryl, about what we were finding in them. When I look at archives like this, historical medical case notes, for example, it always feels like an experience of encountering. And encountering the police surgeon case notes initially, there is that thrill of, that you're reading the first hand account of an incredible Victorian doctor doing this quite incredible work. Um, with all the fascination that that involves. After this initial encounter with the doctor who has authored the records, you begin to encounter the patient um, more, um, the person behind the case. Um, and McEwen's patients during his police surgeon uh, practice are often people who've been the victims of assault, drug and alcohol abuse, and suicide attempts. Um, the case notes mainly record the clinical details, for example, assessment of the patient's condition, diagnosis uh, and treatment. However, they also sometimes reveal contextual details of the case, for example, descriptions of the patient's home environment, uh, snippets of personal narrative and sometimes accounts in the patient's own voice, very rarely, but sometimes in the patient's own voice. Um, so the example I'll focus on here is a case of a woman who attempted suicide by eating rat poison in 1872. This is referred to as a case of phosphorus, phosphorus poisoning in the notes and in the articles. Um, McEwen's case notes in the subsequent article in the Glasgow Medical Journal mainly focus on the diagnosis and treatment sharing the emerging medical knowledge and practice to improve treatment of, of such a, a poisoning. Um, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm going to read a bit of an extract from that. So I'm going to read from the, the notes that are on the right hand side of the screen and apologies that you wouldn't be able to see these in great detail. The, the handwriting is quite faint, um, so I'm going to read it for you instead. Um, so Mary, 20 years. At 11pm on January the 1st, 1872, I was asked hurriedly to see a woman who had taken phosphorus paste for killing rats. 
She was found lying on a stretcher, apparently in an insensible condition, but gasping in a convulsive manner. Pulse, 92, full face, flushed. As she was being carried upstairs to the dressing room, her breath smelled strongly of phosphorus and was slightly luminous in appearance. So that's just the very first section of the of the, the case notes that McEwen writes in his private journal of surgical cases. Um, when you begin to read the case notes differently, um, I began to encounter the patient and her experience uh, in the case, her experience of um, mental ill health and the, and the trauma that she had gone through. The case notes record the woman's suicide attempt and her repeated attempts to buy poison. The exposure of her trauma is also revealed through the descriptive case report, which details her her journey in a way through the police office um, on a stretcher and her condition. Um, I'm also going to share now an, art, uh, an extract from the article, which goes into a bit more detail, uh, which is recorded, uh, where McEwen records the history of the case. From her own statement, it appears that she had had a quarrel with a friend the result of which was that she was determined to poison herself. For this purpose, she entered a druggist's shop to ask for arsenic, but forgetting the correct name and only being able to make several attempts to pronounce the word, the druggist refused to give it. Afterwards, she returned and asked for a pennyworth of poison for killing rats, and on being told that the jars containing it cost three pence each, she went away for the other two pence and returned in half an hour with the money and purchased the rat poison. She took this home, scooped the contents of the jar out with the handle of a spoon, placed them in water and swallowed them as a bolus. She then went to her own room to go to bed, but before she could undress, a burning pain in her stomach commenced and shortly after became very intense and a sour choking smoke took away my breath and forced me to cry out. She further stated that she remembered nothing from this time until she recovered consciousness in the central police office. So the, there's a phrase there that, that McEwen, where McEwen quotes directly from the patient, um, sour choking smoke took my breath away, took away my breath and forced me to cry out. These are the only words in the patient's voice um, and McEwen actually quotes them again um, in the final paragraph of the article, which I'll read as well. The insensibility may be ascribed to the fumes of the phosphorus entering the lungs, the sour choking smoke, which she felt, and possibly also the intense pain. There was a hysterical element in the case, which may have increased the symptoms at the outset of the poisoning, as on two occasions she had had hysterical fits. Rereading the case with the focus on the patient's experience is in itself like the beginning of a reframing, um, just to use the, the title of the series that we're in. There's an emotional impact of working with this material for sure. Um, and I've definitely questioned my use of this material within our heritage practice. For example, how do we present this material when we're trying to engage people with the archive, which is such an important archive in, in Glasgow's medical history. From the initial fascination of the case as part of the intriguing work of the police surgeon, switching the lens towards the patient's experience rather than the surgeon's has an impact on heritage practice as well as the personal and emotional impact. And this can lead to further conversations around mental health, inequalities and violence, which Cheryl has touched upon and we're going to speak about now, I think. So um, over to you, Cheryl. Yeah, thanks so much, Russ. And I, I think, you know, um, this idea of encountering an archive is, is really important and maybe something that we might return to in our discussions. And it'd be great to kind of hear other people's perspectives around that. But that actual word around the archival encounter, I think, has become something um, that lots of people are starting academically to discuss, but also in heritage and, and, and collections conversations as well about how do you encounter 
um, these materials and what kinds of emotions um, are, are around that and what is the significance not only on the material but also on you as a researcher as well. So I, I just thought that was a really fascinating way to frame um, the, um, the, the collection. So um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, my work into the geographies of mental ill health have been very varied. I've looked at psychiatrists such as R.D. Lang, outsider art collections such as Art Extraordinary. I've thought through different spaces such as prisons, asylums, psychiatric hospitals, street corners and community centres. And I've been very fortunate to have always collaborated with individuals individuals with lived experience in this work. And something that has continuously come out of my research, both empirically and theoretically, is the deep connections to violence and its multiple formations that reveal themselves. Be that issues with that connect to what Rob Nixon calls slow violence, violence that occurs gradually and out of sight, a violence of de delayed destruction that is dispersed across time and space, an attritional violence that is typically not viewed as violence at all, or what Johan Gultang calls structural violence, where social structures and institutions can harm the very fabric of our being. Now, many individuals experiencing mental ill health talk about different aspects of violence and different languages that are appropriate to their worlds and experiences, be it through the connections to austerity and poverty, medical structures, the state, exclusions, and often issues of voicelessness in and of itself. So when I first started researching the police surgeon records, as I said earlier, I wasn't thinking about mental ill health in particular, but I was interested in how acts of often, and I don't like this term, but it is a term that's used quite a lot, this idea of spectacular violence, often relating to criminal violence, um, the kind that McEwen is dealing with as a police surgeon, police surgeon, what can it tell us about the people that experience them and the spaces and situations that are connected to them? So in many ways, I was really thinking about what can acts of violence tell us about the broader structures of violence and their impacts on our human condition? Now, in the records, particularly um, in McEwen's scrapbooks, which you saw a little, um, slide of um, earlier on, um, we can see multiple issues of drug and alcohol dependency, domestic violence, assault, sexual assault, murder, and as Ross has commented upon earlier, numerous incidents of people attempting to take their own lives. Within these stories, we see glimpses into the spaces and settings that accompany these. So issues of poverty, deprivation, malnutrition, unemployment, poor housing, gender inequalities. Essentially, what we see is violence in its multiple formations and at its varying different scales. Now, in many ways, this kind of work goes against the grain of working with such records of pioneering medical figures such as William McEwen. We usually look at their achievements and their accomplishments, their practices and their biographies. From the outset of this project, there was a sense of unease for both Ross and I uh, for using McEwen, this prominent white, male, well-known figure in the medical world to think about aspects of violence in relations to individuals that had been deeply marginalised throughout history. And so in the project, we wanted to make sure that we used McEwen as a tool to open up and illuminate marginalised and neglected voices and experiences. And we tried to think about ways in which we could unspotlight McEwen without taking away um, the value of his work and his ideas, but instead to create a new space through this archival work for considering issues of violence that can take us into different terrains about mental ill health. Now, of course, this is not to suggest that victims and perpetrators of violence are always connected to mental ill health. That is absolutely not the case. But in thinking through violence with these archival materials, we are able to start to see more clearly the different spaces, 
structures and experiences of people living, working and dying in the city of Glasgow. An interesting element of police surgeon practice is their mobility. McEwan's role took him on journeys through different spaces of the city, from homes, streets, rivers, bridges through to wastelands. And in doing so, what emerges is an illumination of lost and forgotten spaces in history where marginal figures and their worlds appear. A really kind of striking um, example of this for me in the records and one that is sort of immediately caught my attention and sort of began to really change my thinking of what we could actually do with this collection is just a really small cut out newspaper article um, in the scrapbook um, of an incident that McEwen um, attended and it states attempted suicide. On Saturday night, a woman called Jane Morton or Russell, residing in Govan Street, attempted to commit suicide in the Clyde. She carried a female child of eight months in her arms and threw herself into the river near Nelson's monument. Now, for me, this really small glimpse into this incredibly distressing and upsetting experience opened up so many questions about this individual's world, or these individuals, because there was two of them, these individuals' worlds. Who is Jane? What has happened to her? Why is she being drawn to the Clyde that Saturday evening? What are her living experiences in Govan? What does she think and feel? And what story does she want us to tell, if any, about her and the child she is carrying? So in terms of reframing, which is, as Ross mentioned, the kind of key remit of this series of events, we feel that by turning to the police surgeon and their records, we can open up new avenues of exploration into aspects of human experience that are largely neglected in historical accounts. Thinking about violence and its multiple manifestations through these materials paves the way forward for thinking more critically and creatively about worlds that people inhabit. Now, through the police surgeon records, we see the most harrowing stories of lived experience, lives lived and lost through violence. And these are individuals such as Jessie Edwards Miller, who was murdered at home by her husband, Archibald Miller. Um, and, and we can see that these can illuminate so much more about issues of violence than just the act itself. McEwen's notebook, for example, states, the scuffle between the woman, so um, Jessie and her assailant, Archibald, had evidently begun in the kitchen. Some of the drawers were pulled out as if in the struggle. She appeared to have been knocked first on the one side of the table and then on the other, as there were two pools of blood, one on each side. All along the lobby where the struggle seemed to have gone on next were droppings of blood. And it seemed as if the woman had managed to gain the stairhead and had then been forced to return to the house. When she fell exhausted by the repeated blows she must have received, she had seemingly been making for the private room as her head lay in that direction and her feet were stretched out towards the outer door. She appeared to have struggled hard, as all over the kitchen and lobby walls are marks of where her hands or head have struck, with clots of blood and tufts of hair adhering. We see in this quotation um, the intimate geographies of violence of both the crime scene and of the body. But in thinking through these materials, we also are offered a window into considering Jessie's wider worldly experiences. Court papers um, from the trial are littered with voices from neighbours, family and friends who share their reflections on Jessie's world. The consistent nature of the domestic violence she feared and experienced, the alcohol abuse she lived with, the challenging health conditions she faced and the complex financial and living situations that were bound up in her relationship. 
And also, I should stress that in these court records, we also see her her immense friendship, her immense kindness to others. We see a lot of different aspects that are not necessarily bound up um, with violence at all. But in many ways, then, what we see when we look at McEwen's records is not McEwen at all but instead a range of individuals rarely mentioned in the medical histories of Glasgow and its making. Now, geographers Emma Laurie and Ian Shaw in their work, Violent Conditions, note that violent conditions forcefully constrain, traumatise and poison the very resources of our becoming. This is an injustice lodged in the fibres and skeletons of being. Thinking about these individuals' experiences in the context of the social injustice in which they lived helps us to piece together a broader understanding of the difficulties that they faced, including aspects of mental ill health. It helps us to think more broadly about what structures were in place to support and suppress these experiences, and we hope um, that aspects of this reframing and aspects of this project will help us to challenge the deep injustices that are still very prevalent um, in our city today. So thank you and I'll pass you back to Ross for opening up hopefully for some conversation. It was really interesting what you were saying Cheryl about um, the the role, first of all, the, the first thing I'm going to mention is the, the interesting thing about the role of McEwen in this, which in a way is almost this kind of reverting back by even mentioning this, I feel as if I'm kind of reverting back to how we previously would have looked at the, the records. Um, but from a from the point of view of looking at the records as being, you know, in many ways collected initially and authored by McEwen himself, um, I think that's an, an element of it that we, we definitely kind of need to pay attention to and possibly pay attention to more, but in a different way from what we might have done previously. Um, and in particular, I'm thinking about the scrapbook, the medical scrapbook, um, which you, you made reference to in, in that case. You, you mentioned the attempted suicide at the Clyde. Um, and the scrapbook is a really incredible book um, that, that was collated by McEwen during his time as police surgeon between 1872 and 1875, with it seems almost every single mention of um, McEwen's work at cases pasted into a, a fairly small uh, notebook um, re recording this incredible range of work that, 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 that he was doing. But the collecting of that material in the first place by McEwen at that time, um, particularly from the local newspapers and so on, is in itself a really interesting act um, that McEwen was undertaking. And particularly given that the role of police surgeon was a marginal kind of role in, in, in medicine and surgery at that time, it, it, it was definitely seen, I think, as being a uh, Certainly, it didn't seem to be a job that everyone wanted. Um, you know, the fact that McEwen got the job, you know, it was only his second job after qualifying. Um, it, was a, it was still a fairly undefined role, I think, in, in many places. Um, so anyway, the, the fact that McEwen was actually going to quite great lengths to collect these scraps of newspaper articles, I think is something that's interesting about his role in the gathering of these records. Um, I don't know. I know that the scrapbook is one of the you know, probably one of your favourite bits <laughs> of the of the collection. Um, and I don't know if there's more that, that can be done in terms of looking at that. You know what the role of the of, of the person collecting the material is as well. Yeah, I mean, I love the scrapbook because it's like a map. It's a map of McEwen. In a way, I guess it, it could be a map of McEwen's ego as well, like this idea of collecting all the, the amazing things that the media media says about you. Um, but I think w one reason why I love the scrapbook is, is not just because of what it, 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 the stories that it highlights, but because I think 
I think it helps you to reflect on McEwen as a as a practitioner or, or as a police surgeon. And I think one of the things that in our project around diff we've done, we've looked at lots of different police surgeons. Um, and I think the role that that played and the things that they saw um, and the violence that they, they ultimately experienced, I think really did affect them. Um, in a lot of ways. And I think the, the scrapbook, that idea of someone cutting something out and sticking something in and keeping it, I think just kind of reminds me of the humanness of, of McEwen and, and this idea. I mean, he might not have been sticking it <laughs> in himself at that point, I don't know. But this idea of, of really thinking about what these experiences, so just the example of, of Jesse, for example, that. McEwen was there, he saw that violence, he, he had to deal with that situation. That has a very long lasting effect on people. And we know that from looking at other police surgeons, it really does alter and change um, the way that they see society, the way that they see um, each other and, and the human condition more broadly. So I think the scrapbook is a nice reminder for me of McEwen's humanity um, and what he must have experienced as well. But I, I certainly think there is so much scope to, to do so much with that material that we'll never manage to do um, in our lifetime. So definitely people should, should check those scrapbooks out, I think. Um, we're actually starting to get a few uh, questions in the chat, which is good. Um, so, there's one here from a couple there from from Kristen. Yes, uh -huh. um, so <laughs> thank you so much to both of you for such a succinct and fascinating discussion of this material. I, I'm desperate to look at it now because it seems so, um, yeah, I completely agree with what you're saying, Cheryl, in terms of it being so rare and giving this really vibrant uh, snapshot of, of Glasgow in its entirety at this time. Um, and actually, in particular, the thing that I was really interested in for both of you is how these kind of records tell us about mental health in terms of gender and class, um, in particular because it's police surgeon records. So it's kind of done in a sort of carceral setting and in a setting that's often very associated with doing something wrong. So having these uh, depictions of mental health within these records in particular um, how you think uh, gender and class is, is perhaps represented. Um, and then the second question, I have to apologise for asking two questions, but it is, you know, that that idea of, of the, how the emotional impact on encountering uh, material like this on researchers, and if there is any ways of, of mitigating that harm and, and ensuring that researchers take care of themselves, but also tackle this research and, and these materials um, sensitively. But uh, both of you, thank you so much for such a, a brilliant overview as well. Oh, thank you so much for asking your amazing questions. It's so nice to, to hear people talk. Um, I guess in terms of, Ross might have maybe a few more things to say about your, your first question about gender and race. I think one of the things, I've worked quite a lot on sort of carceral geographies and, and sort of thought through the difficulties of, of actually hearing what is not about someone being told they're doing something wrong um, or being placed within that context and particularly with mental health um, the fact that a lot of the records that we have around it come from institutions and, and, and people in power if you like um, from the psychiatrist voice etc it, it can be quite challenging to think about what are the voices or, and experiences of the individuals themselves. But what intrigues me about the police surgeon is that although they are um, part of the police, they're actually medical professionals as well. So you get this interesting sense where I never get the sense that McEwen is necessarily being judgmental about what has happened so what has been done or what this person is experiencing he's much more interested in in what form that's taking in terms of its kind of medical formation but also quite interested in the social life of that as well particularly around um so Kirsty, who's here, did some incredible work um, around a stabbing that he was really involved in. Um, and again, he was very interested in obviously what happens um, medically, but he was also kind of interested in, in how this was able to, to happen at all. So 
I think it's a very interesting role, um, an interesting set of documents, because although it is in that carceral, carceral sphere to a certain extent, it also isn't as well. I don't know if you agree, Ross, if you think. Yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting question. And in a way, like you say, Cheryl, it does bring up the the kind of issue of the role of the police surgeon itself and, and the dynamics that are there within that role, which are are, are not straightforward. Um, and I think that was one of the, the things that kind of fascinated us about, about the records, because this role of the police surgeon, it seemed to be caught between, not caught in a conflicted kind of way, but in the middle of the, the medical world, um, the, 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 the police and, and world in terms of, um, you know, the law and, and, and that side of things. But then a big part of the, the police surgeon role was also related to public health as well. Um, there's a real public health role of the police surgeon, um, certainly you can see it in some of the cases that McEwen attends to. For example, there's the case of the rotting fish that he's he's called to. Um, there's some uh, someone's reported rotting fish on a street in Glasgow um, that's clearly causing an issue, uh, and they they call the police surgeon to attend to it because it's a public health issue. So, so there's the the, the range of uh, kind of cases and so on that he's involved in is so broad and, and covers the criminal cases or cases with a criminal element to them. Um, but also, like I mentioned before, the police surgeon was referred to as a casualty surgeon. And it, and it really, the police office really did operate as a accident and emergency department um, for the city. Um, so if someone had simply, you know, had an accident, on the street, they would often be just brought to the police office as the first in the first instance. Um, even if there's absolutely no element of criminality or or anything involved in the case, they would be taken to the police office because there's a police surgeon there um, who can treat them. So, so it's that really kind of quite interesting, mm -hmm. unusual dynamic um, of medicine, the law and public health and um, so but the, then the, the question about gender and class representation in in these records is really really interesting because of the kind of cases that McEwen um that McEwen encounters there's one one of the articles that he wrote kind of just towards the end of his time as a police surgeon is about uh, wounds wounds and the instruments that produce them, I think the article is called. Um, and that is a really kind of systematic catalogue of cases that he's encountered that are mainly, sometimes accidents, mainly um, assaults caused by wounds. And you get little glimpses of uh, the, the social circumstances of the people involved in them and their, their home life and things like um, alcohol abuse being involved. And there's also quite clear uh, suggestions of domestic violence in amongst those as well. Um, that's a really interesting piece of work that McEwen did where representations of gender and class, I, I think, are, are are, are re would be really interesting to look at more more closely. Um, so anyway, I don't know if that doesn't maybe particularly answer the question, but uh, <laughs> just just to kind of go into the, the there's uh, and again it highlights the, the interest in this material because it it is so um, rich and quite complex the, the the material in terms of what's there. I mean, I think one of the big attractions for. Um, ourselves to the material was the the ability that it had to open up those kinds of conversations if read as you said in a slightly different different way um, so I think it's definitely something that 
um, we have looked at that idea of, of how do, because actually the people that McEwen is encountering in his police surgeon practice are not people that you would ever um, have collections necessarily about in other circumstances. So you're getting to hear the voice of the city of Glasgow in the 19th century in a way that you never would um, before. And I think that's really exciting. I also think it's really challenging um, for research, but I think it just really does highlight that if you use these collections and you sort you, I mean, reframe as your kind of context, but you do reframe them, you literally flip them around to think it, this isn't about hearing McEwen's voice because we know McEwen's voice. This is actually about how do we use McEwen to open up those spaces of dialogue between the unknowns, um, the unknown spaces, the unknown practices and the unknown people as well. So that's kind of what we were excited about. And it's not to say that there isn't a, a huge project to be done on McEwen as a police surgeon. That is a fantastic opportunity because nobody has really done that. Um, but for us, as the kind of scholars that we are, we're also really interested in getting to do those aspects of inequality as well. And um, in terms of your second question, which I think is really important, and I know uh, from looking at a few people here, so for example, my wonderful, incredible PhD student, um, Gilly, um, working on mental ill health and the kind of records around them can be deeply, deeply challenging, I think, personally. Um, I think these kinds of records um, a, in terms of thinking about violence can be really, really challenging. And I've certainly had times in the archive where I haven't been prepared to look at certain materials. I've made the decision not to look at certain things because I, I actually find them too upsetting or I wasn't in the right frame of mind at the time to be able to do that um, carefully. And I think it's something that Often we talk a lot in research arenas about ethics and about our kind of positionalities and things, but often we do that with living subjects and we don't often think about it in relation to, to historical research and, and dead subjects. And I think we're starting to have more conversations about why it does really matter to think about ourselves as researchers and, and as Ross said, that notion of encountering, because I certainly think um, in the, the, the criminal archives, I think it, it can be really, really difficult to uh, encounter this material safely. And again, it comes back to uh, archivists and collections responsibility sometimes about, about thinking about they want these materials to be seen, but actually who is going to be able to, to look at them in a safe in a safe way. So I think there's a lot more conversations we have to have. Um, across both um, mental health collections, but also criminal collections and, and other kinds of collections um, as well, war collections, for example, um, about the sort of safety and, and ethical issues around our, our, own, our own sense of selves, I think. And I would love to hear more people's responses um, to that, because I think it's a really, really important question. Yeah, it's, um, it, it's really, interesting the, the the case that I um, mentioned in, in my kind of little introductory bit um, about Mary um, and her suicide attempt one of the really challenging bits for that for me was the 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 record of it the, the case notes of it did detail her journey towards her attempted suicide in terms of the, the history that had clearly been gathered by McEwen and the, the police, I think, that, that he was working with, <clears throat> who found Mary in her flat and, and had obviously gathered that um, account of how she had tried to buy the poison repeatedly and, and her, in, her interaction with the druggist um, to, to get the poison and then, and then going and taking it. For me, that that's a very much a kind of one of those um, kind of like hidden or un, rarely kind of revealed bits of experience that um, you don't see often in any records that we have, and that we certainly I wouldn't have expected to see in our McEwen uh, collections either. And also, it's an element of the record that you 
initially you can kind of easily kind of pass over as well because you're looking at if when you're looking at it from a um, kind of um, medical historical perspective, you're looking at the you know what did the surgeon do, what's the treatment, and 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 how did he present that and share it with his profession uh, through the, the the journal. But whereas that focus on the story of Mary's attempts and her attempts to buy poison is just such a a difficult thing to to read and there's quite a few lots of instances of cases like that where um we you know when we're wanting to make a an archive collection much more accessible and much more known and used by people when engaged with by by researchers because this McEwen collection previously the, the police surgeon part of it in particular was very you know, not used really at all. Very few researchers were aware of it. Um, so when we tried to then make it more known um, and, and talk about it much more, you then kind of encounter these kind of records and think, oh, and you kind of, and there's almost a kind of pause and in, 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 certainly for me anyway, on a personal level, I kind of do pause and think, oh, you know, what do we do with this stuff? And, and how do we make sure people can engage with it and interrogate it and, and use it? For research, but also without us, you know, further revealing the the pain and the trauma of the people that are that are captured in it. It's a real, it's a really kind of difficult issue that I certainly struggle with at times um, as someone who works with collections. Um, and I think particularly with these collections, there's there's a sort of um, glamorization of violence that can that can happen with crime um, and we see that you know I, I, I'm a crime fiction fan and we see it on the TV and actually what we have to remember particularly when it's collections and I think this is why the materiality of archives is so important because um, looking at them online there is not the same sense of that this is a this is a human being this is a real person's life the most painful experience of their life um in mary's case and in other people's cases this is something that really happened to someone and i think um actually being able to look at that material and it's in its physical form reminds you of that and i think that's why um although online collections are wonderful and have been wonderful especially during the pandemic i think um when we're thinking about the ethics of the archive we're often reminded of that most profoundly when we have it in our hands and we see it and i think that's something with um archives really time to violence and to crime um i think that's incredibly incredibly important so yeah so yeah, we have a few more comments coming in in the chat box. Um, so Gilly has has a has a question there as well about. I mean, I don't know Gilly if you want to actually ask that or if you're happy for me to give a wee summary or. Hello, you know. hello, I'm here. Um, hi there. Um, it was really just thank you so much for this. It's so interesting. I've heard you talk about McEwen before, but I find these stories very touching, and as a writer. The, the stories are very engaging and that was part of the problem I had when I started looking at the Gart Naval Archive which I had to be kind of dragged away from eventually because I just didn't nobody had the time I think to do this I concluded I would have to sleep there because I found it frustrating to hand all the books back at the end of the day and then start again the following day because I had no idea whether maybe one story that was a wonderful small story that patient wouldn't appear again ever whereas there were other people that did pop up regularly. So I just wondered how you approach a challenge like this of establishing a theme and then looking for cases that are going to illustrate that, pulling them out and letting the rest go. It's difficult for me to let go of a lot of the stories that I've been seeing. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, letting go, I think it's not a good thing um, that anybody doing archival research can do. And I think, you know, all those debates around archival fever and stuff, they're very true. Um, it's always what might you miss? What haven't you looked at? Um, what is just beyond your grasp in that next notebook? Um, I think with the police surgeon material, it is a smaller collection. Um, so McEwen's collection is enormous, um, but the actual police surgeon collection is relatively small. Um, and actually, 
we were able to sort of think through it um, and, and, and work our way through it. Um, but I think in general advice, I think it is just something you have to accept as a as an archival scholar that these these people will stay with you. I'm very haunted actually by a lot of the individuals that I've encountered throughout my whole um, my whole archival career. Um, there's people that I have stayed with me that I've never written about. Um, I don't know how to do it, um, and I will eventually, hopefully, get to them. But I think. Um, I think with the police surgeon one, it, we were very lucky in that we, I think we've pretty much looked at all of McEwen's stuff now, um, maybe, um, but I think with other collections, it is about just knowing that you can't do everything, but you can do a lot with what you've got. Yeah, I would agree. I think we've been in a way lucky that the McEwen police surgeon material is so contained um, and, and we, you know, we were kind of, I think at the stage where we were looking for more <laughs> material with, within the McEwen collection that linked to that period and, and so on, but it is very contained and that does make it a bit easier to, to work with, I would say. Um, so we have another question here from Pratyusha. How much effect would a person's general bias be on the outcome and representation of a case? Um, and, I, and I think that maybe refers to the the person recording the case, i.e. in this case McEwen. Mm. So yeah, I, I think it's, a, it's an interesting area to look at um, in terms of how the, the authorship of of the case notes and, and, and how how they're written, how they're written and how they're represented, definitely. Um, and I think that one of the areas that is interesting to look at um, in, in this case, in the case of McEwen as a, as a surgeon, is reading around uh, the, the, the case work that he was doing and, and the other kinds of writing that he was producing at the time. Um, there's some, some of the correspondence that he has, for example, with some of his colleagues, where he sometimes refers to work that he's, that he's doing within the police surgeon uh, area. Um, but also some of those that that correspondence from that period in the 1870s he's talking about other kind of issues that are happening at the time and uh, you know kind of bigger issues and, and sometimes kind of personal issues as well and I think I think from that you can sometimes get a sense of of his you know moral standpoint on certain issues and and, and intellectual approach to certain things as well um, the whole area of um, the hereditary argument about criminality and so on as well, something that comes through in some of the correspondence, which is quite interesting. So, yeah, it's a really interesting mm. question and something that is definitely worth looking at that involving that reading around the case notes themselves. Yeah, and I think I think it's a great question. And I think again, in the I think what's so amazing about this college is that in the heritage part of it is that you are really challenging your collections and I think um, you know there is potential here to really take McEwen to task as a police surgeon and to really think about what he was doing and how he was doing and how that connects to this kind of bigger you know um, securitization of the city and the state control of the city and you could do some really really interesting work there um, and I think that's what is really exciting about these events um, and, and these kinds of conversations because we don't want to just reproduce the same work um, over and over again because the work that has been done on McEwen stands really firmly. It's very, very good and there's lots of potential to look at the great things that he has done and continue and, and, and throughout his career, which was mind blowing. But actually what these events hopefully encourage is that there's a lot of potential to do other kinds of critical work as well that is equally as valuable and that equally uses the collections to its kind of maximum capacity. So I think these kinds of questions, I don't have an answer to that question, but I think it would be really amazing um, to do research in that area and to, to see what, what you could find and to really put those collections um, to the test. So yeah. Thanks Cheryl, and that that's a, seems like a nice way to kind of wind up <laughs> the, the event tonight actually. Uh, our new event programme 
begins in September. So please do keep an eye for that um, on our website. Um, and all of our re previous reframed events are going to be available on the YouTube channel. So please do check them out because there's lots of great conversations there. Um, so finally, for me, I just want to thank Cheryl again so much for, for, for coming along tonight and, and joining us on this. It's always great to talk to you about police surgeon stuff and other things too. Um, so thank you. Um, and to everyone else who's come along, thanks very much for coming and have a great night. <laughs>